thanks everyone for joining. I know we've got a pretty big group on today, which is, is wonderful. This is such an important topic and it's one we've been wanting to do for a long, long time. So we're grateful to have uh, to have Dr. Robin Gore joining us uh, today for this topic. And the title of today's webinar is, What Do These Numbers Mean? Decoding Your Labs. So Dr. Gore is a board certified rheumatologist in private practice in Tustin, California. And she's also a clinical professor of medicine at, at UCLA, the University of California in Los Angeles. Dr. Gore is a past chair of the Southern California chapter of the Arthritis Foundation. She's a past president of the Southern California Rheumatology Society and a past member of the board of directors of the American College of Rheumatology. Uh, she's the immediate past president of the California Rheumatology Alliance, a member of the board of directors of the Arthritis Foundation and on the board of managers at the uh, of United Rheumatology. So she's recognized for her contributions to patient, physician education, and community service, including the development of Bone Builders, a program devoted to educating girls and young women about the importance of healthy lifestyles in the prevention of osteoporosis. So we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Dor join us for this uh, this session this evening. It's very important. Uh, we're um, Gonna, uh, this, my name is Ben Knoll. I'm the Director of Research for the Global Healthy Living Foundation and Creaky Joints and also a, the Principal Investigator for Arthritis Power, our Patient Research Registry. And before we start, before I uh, turn it over to Dr. Dorr for this presentation, just wanted to remind people about a few housekeeping rules. Uh, we have everyone is on listen-only mode, which is essentially means mute since we do record this webinar for people who are unable to join us live. And the way that we handle questions is we would be delighted for you to ask your questions uh, during this webinar and we'll address them at the end. So the way to do this is to put your questions within the chat window. There's a section that actually says questions. So you can type your questions there. Um, you can type them anytime during the presentation. In fact, it's better to get them in early because then they'll be answered uh, first, you know, when we come to the Q&A portion of this session. Um, and then um, we'll, we'll do our best to address all the questions that we can. And of course, the best questions are those that are not necessarily specific to you individually, but also pertain to other people. So to the extent possible, try to ask questions that, uh, that are kind of generalizable, that, are, uh, that can help other people as well. Uh, understand their labs and, and what these numbers mean. So with that, um, we're just delighted, as all get out, to welcome Dr. Robin Dorr to the session tonight. So uh, with that, Dr. Dorr, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much. I hope uh, that you can uh, hear me um, now. Yes. Um, good. So I really am excited to uh, present this material today because it's extremely important that patients have an understanding of what their labs mean, but also not to get um, too concerned if a lab shows something, because it's really the examination of the patient and the history that makes, uh, makes a difference. Of course, now I'm trying to advance the slides and they don't want to advance, so let me see what I can do here. It never fails. Ah, there we go. All right. Um, so as it says here, laboratory tests are important in making that diagnosis and assessing the rheumatic disease. But it's the, really the important thing is the um, ex examining the patient, taking their history, and putting that all together to try to make a diagnosis. And what it says here, while useful, no rheumatic disease is established by tests alone. And what I have happened, a lot of patients come to see me because they have a positive ANA and they go online and read that they could have lupus. Now, not, that's not something that, uh, that uh, this organization does, but certainly there are other websites when you look at a positive ANA, it makes you think you have lupus. And as we'll go through, there are lots of things that cause a positive ANA. So I think it's extremely important that, that a very thorough history is taken. My patient complained because it's seven pages long, my form, but I need to know about the family history. I need to know about the past history of what's happened to the patient. And then the laboratory tests can confirm what's going on. But one of the really difficult things in rheumatology is to figure what tests to order. So I'll have a patient come and see me 
And they'll say, well, why didn't the other doctor order those? And um, I can't really answer that question. Um, but certainly for any autoimmune disease, it's really important to be seeing a specialist, whether it's Crohn's disease and seeing a gastroenterologist or uh, rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or ankylosing spondylitis to see a rheumatologist. And one of the problems is there aren't very many rheumatologists around. So again, I think that's another thing that, uh, that, that, uh, that Global Healthy Living does is really help empower patients so, uh, to really have knowledge get in to see the doctor that they need, and then not be intimidated because so often um, patients can be intimidated by the specialist, and that's uh, not something that uh, is conducive to a good uh, patient-provider uh, relationship. See if I can get this to work. There we go. So these are just pictures that I have used, and they're old pictures from rheumatoid arthritis. So if a patient came to see me and and I saw hands like this. Luckily, we don't really see people with rheumatoid arthritis anymore with, we shouldn't anyway, with the hands like the two bottom slides. But if we look at the top left-hand slide, that could be lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, some other autoimmune disease. But immediately looking at that with the PIP joint, that's the proximal interphalangeal joint, that's the joint in the middle of the fingers. With that swollen, that patient has some autoimmune disease. Very rarely it could be a virus, but if it's there for more than six weeks, it's some sort of autoimmune disease. When we look at the, the picture with the two hands, what you see is the knuckles, the, what we call the, the metacarpal phalangeal joint. So the knuckles at the base where the fingers join onto the hand, those are swollen. And those are only swollen in two or three different types of arthritis. So just the way a person's hands looks, the <coughs> clinician should have a really good idea of what's going on. And we now can certainly prevent the deformities that you see at the bottom of the slide from happening. And why it's so important to be your advocate and get in and push and shove and get in to see the specialist as soon as you can, because the sooner we treat the appropriate patients, the better their outcome should be. So again, looking at pictures that where it says OA, um, you know, it says lab or exam. Most cases, the eyes have it. Again, seeing is, makes the diagnosis. So where it says OA, that's osteoarthritis, and that hand could really only be two conditions. One is osteoarthritis. The other is arthritis related to psoriasis. The middle picture are tender points with fibromyalgia, and the newer term for that is chronic widespread pain. And this is a Again, there are no blood tests for fibromyalgia. So this, again, is where the physical examination and the history is so important. The woman with the um, eyeshadow on, this is either poly or dermatomyositis. I actually saw a patient with leprosy, however, who looked like that. But again, you see that face and you're, you're left with only three diseases that could really cause that. So again, it's the appearance, the examination, the history that tells us what laboratory studies to perform. The middle picture with, uh, it says SLE, that's the classic Malar rash uh, that we see with lupus, but only about half or 60% of patients with lupus actually have that rash. And something called rosacea or adult lupus can look exactly, I mean, adult acne can look exactly like that. So again, um, we take all the information together. Where it says vasculitis, that the, the raised red spots on the skin, sometimes diabetes can cause that, but usually it's an autoimmune disease or a viral hepatitis can cause a vasculitis like that as well. And the, the slide with the two hands, uh, you can't see it very well, but there's actual loss of pigment over the knuckles where the fingers join the hands. And that's a fancy term called Gottron sign. And that, again, you look at that and you know the patient, there's only one thing, and that's polymyositis. So why examining the patient uh, is so important and can tell us what's going on even before we order the laboratory studies. So this slide just talks about when we, when we look, what laboratory studies do we expect to see? In someone with rheumatoid arthritis, the blood test for rheumatoid arthritis is only positive about 80% of the time. 
There's a newer test called an anti-CCP or ACPA, A-C-P-A, that is more specific and sensitive for rheumatoid arthritis. And it also is associated, and we'll have more slides in a few minutes about this, with what we call a poor prognosis rheumatoid arthritis, meaning the person with the positive CCP is more likely to need biologic therapy, the injections or small uh, molecule pills, because their disease could be worse if we don't aggressively treat it. The sedimentation rate, I've got a slide that talks more about this in a few minutes, uh, is a very old test that looks at inflammation and um, can be done in the doctor's office or a lab. And that is elevated, as it says here, in about half the people with rheumatoid arthritis. So you can have rheumatoid arthritis, have a negative blood test for rheumatoid arthritis, and have a normal sedimentation rate. And again, that's where the examination comes in. If you've had rheumatoid arthritis for a while, on x-rays, you'll see that demineralization means loss of mineral in the bone. The bones might have erosions, which are eating away areas in the bone. And if that occurs, that person needs to be on biologic therapy because only biologic therapy has been shown to reduce the occurrence of erosions. Joint space narrowing means the cartilage gets eaten away and the bones then rub together. And that's harder to prevent than the erosions. And if, we don't do it very much anymore, but if a clinician would stick a needle into a joint with fluid on it, they would find lots of white blood cells in that fluid because of inflammation. So that's rheumatoid arthritis, looking at the exam, the labs, x-rays, and fluid. Lupus, again, as I've mentioned, is uh, confusing in that people can have the, that positive blood test for lupus and not have lupus. What's much more specific is this uh, DNA antibody a test that's positive in 60 to 70% of patients with lupus, but almost all patients who have lupus that affects the kidneys. The good news is for the lupus patients that usually their arthritis is not destructive. You don't have the damage to the joints, but that doesn't mean the joints certainly uh, aren't painful. And if there was fluid in a joint, there'd be much less inflammation. Ankylosing spondylitis, which occurs in typically younger people. We used to think it was more common in men, but now we're seeing almost equal number of men and women who are diagnosed with this. And it causes what we call inflammatory back pain, where the patient wakes up, has terrible pain in the morning, and it gets better as the day goes on and exercise helps. And between 80 and 90% of patients will have a gene, an HLA B27 gene, but you can have ankylosing spondylitis and 10% of patients don't have that gene. The x-ray gives you this characteristic, what's called a bamboo spine, where you look at the x-ray and it really looks like a piece of bamboo where the vertebral bodies um, can be fused together. But that occurs later in the disease. And again, if diagnosed early, we can slow that progression and hopefully prevent it from happening. And again, the fluid there can have inflammation or not have inflammation. And typically the joints affected with ankylosing spondylitis, so the bigger joints like the hips, and the knees. Gout is not an inflammatory um, condition, but it certainly uh, can um, cause, uh, it's not an autoimmune condition, but it causes a lot of inflammation, very painful attacks. And you would think since the uric acid is the hallmark of gout that everybody with a gout attack would have an elevated serum uric acid level. And in fact, that's not what happens. It's only elevated in 70 to 90%. But if you draw fluid off the joint, then you will see those uric acid crystals and they're sharp pointed needles. And you can imagine how they're causing so much pain and inflammation. So again, it's the exam, the blood test, x-rays if needed, uh, taking fluid off the joints if needed. But now most of the time we can do what's called an ultrasound of the joints and look at early changes in the joints and determine that it's gout or rheumatoid arthritis without having to draw that fluid off the joint. Okay, well, I'm trying to, there we go. No, that, okay. So again, when we're looking at osteoarthritis, there's not too much, there's no blood tests that are abnormal in osteoarthritis. So if you would go in and ask the doctor to order a blood test for osteoarthritis, 
that's the wear and tear that we get as we get older. But unfortunately, our, our veterans who have uh, come back um, from Iraq or Afghanistan, they have had many injuries to their joints. And within five to 10 years, they can get develop osteoarthritis in those joints. So typically, we think of it older people, but injuries, especially uh, traumatic injuries, can cause very early onset osteo arthritis. But the x-rays are characteristic. There's bone spurs. That's what osteophytes are. And if there's fluid, it's not inflammatory. As we talked about, fibromyalgia is really chronic, widespread pain. There's no joint swelling. These patients have terrible muscle pain, and they can have a positive blood test for lupus, and they can have lots of symptoms of lupus. They can have the fatigue, uh, sun sensitivity, um, joint pain, but not any joint swelling. Um, and so at times, there can be difficult to differentiate between fibromyalgia and lupus, and we'll talk more about how to do that. That diagnosis and difference is usually based on laboratory studies. Scleroderma, there is actually a blood test for scleroderma called the SCL70. But again, everybody with scleroderma doesn't have a positive SCL70. Most patients with scleroderma do have a positive ANA, as it says 90% of patients. But when the rheumatologist sees that positive ANA, that's where we order the other tests, like the double-stranded DNA for lupus and the SCL70 to differentiate scleroderma. And these patients, as it says, have have significant systemic disease. There's tightening of the he uh, skin in the hands. There can be scar tissue in the lungs. The uh, have trouble swallowing. Calcium deposits can be seen in the hands. And so again, here, the physical exam is what, and history is really what gives us that, uh, that diagnosis. The polymyositis picture, the one we saw with the woman with the uh, red eyelids, these patients have muscle weakness. Sometimes they have pain and sometimes not. And their CK or CPK is elevated. And that's a, a blood test for muscle inflammation, the creatinine phosphokinase. Normal for most labs is, oh, about 72. And patients who have significant disease can have labs that are three or 4,000. And these patients are so weak, they're usually actually in bed. And unfortunately, this can affect the breathing muscles and the heart muscles. And so a uh, severe case, it can be very difficult uh, to treat. Radiographs really aren't very helpful and uh, they don't usually have fluid on the joints that we can, we can look at. So the next, this slide is really looking at, um, at, at lupus and, and whoopsie, I, I, I advanced again when I didn't really mean to, and that positive ANA. And as the slide says, here that that um, that 10 to 37 percent of adults above the age of 65 have a positive ANA. That certainly doesn't mean that they um, have have lupus by it, by any means. And just a normal healthy person, uh, their ANA can be positive in three to 15 percent of people. So just because a patient has a positive ANA and that stands for anti nuclear antibody, does not mean that they have lupus by any means. And exposure to sun can cause a positive ANA. And lots of medications can cause a positive ANA. And the next couple of slides, I'm not going to go over the medicines, but just to show you that there, are, I think, are over 100 different medicines that can cause a positive ANA. Now, some of these patients actually have lupus related to these medicines, but most of the time, it's just a positive ANA um, that they have. So what's in common with these um, um, estrogen, so female hormones, testosterone, male hormones, some of the drugs used to treat rheumatoid arthritis, like TNF inhibitors, can cause a positive ANA. Tetracycline can cause a positive ANA. So we don't normally like a patient with lupus who already has a positive ANA to be given tetracycline. Same thing can be said for sulfasalazine, a drug that we use to treat rheumatoid arthritis can also cause a positive ANA. So we don't like to use sulfasalazine in a patient who already has, has lupus. Most diuretics, like hydrochlorothiazide, uh, most blood pressure medicines, medicines that are used to treat heart irregularities, all cause positive ANAs. And there's actually a blood test that we can order to determine if the patient's ANA is related to a medicine, and that's called an antihistone antibody. So if a patient is on a lot of medicines, 
and the average 70 year old takes eight prescription medicines um, and they're on this very long list, then I'm going to order that antihistone antibody. And if it's positive, it means that that patient's, at least their ANA is related to the drugs they're taking. And so a man I saw yesterday, he was on a statin, he was on a blood pressure medicine, and he was on a medicine to control his heart rhythm. And all three of those medicines could cause a positive ANA. So it didn't mean I was going to talk to his cardiologist about stopping those medicines, but I actually put him on hydroxychloroquine, a medicine that's used to treat lupus to try to prevent his body from developing symptoms related to that positive ANA that was due to uh, the medication. Other laboratory tests that you might be told that, uh, that, are, are, that you have positive, the SSA and SSB, when those are both positive, a patient typically has Sjogren's syndrome. So Sjogren's syndrome is where there's dry eyes and dry mouth. Uh, there can be dry lungs causing a, a, a dry cough. Frequently, these patients look like they have the mumps because their salivary glands are so swollen and their eyes are so dry that the eyelids can actually be swollen. And some of these patients, their eyes are so dry that they actually get ulcerations, uh, damage to the lining of the eye uh, from this dryness. The other reason, if we have a patient who has um, typically lupus and they're pregnant, if they have a positive SSA and SSB, that can be associated with complete heart block in the unborn baby. And I've had patients who've actually needed to have a pacemaker placed in the, uh, the baby's heart while the woman is pregnant in order to prevent this from happening. So that's why we always encourage our lupus patients who are pregnant to see a, um, a high-risk obstetrician so they know the complications that, that can occur. And because of that, what we're seeing is patients with lupus um, are having better and better pregnancy outcomes because of the advances in what's called maternal uh, fetal health. Another blood test is called the ENA or extractable nuclear antigen and RNP. This is specific for a condition called mixed connective tissue disease. This is like a, a mild form of lupus, but patients don't tend to get the kidney or um, central nervous system disease like seizures or strokes that some of the patients with severe lupus can get. Then there's an anti-centromere antibody. And again, this is just the way the, the ANA is read on the lab slip. It'll say a centromere pattern. And that can be seen in patients who have Raynaud's, <coughs> excuse me, which is spasm of the blood vessels in response to cold, which can be seen all by itself. But it could also be common in patients who have autoimmune diseases, and one of those would be scleroderma. The SM or Smith antibody is very specific for lupus. So if a patient has a positive ANA and a positive SM, there's no question that they have lupus, whereas the ANA by itself, as I've mentioned, is not specific. As I've already mentioned, the double-stranded DNA is seen in patients who have lupus that affects the kidneys, and that positive antihistone antibody is seen in drug-induced lupus. Some labs still run what's called a single-stranded DNA antibody or the SSDNA, and that can be seen with drug-induced lupus as well, but more and more of the labs are not running that test. So this slide really talks about rheumatology history, and uh, one of my friends, uh, Dan Wallace, who is certainly the West Coast uh, lupus expert, in my opinion, got, bought Dr. Du Bois' lupus practice back in the late 1970s. And Dr. Du Bois was really considered the father of lupus, who was involved in developing the very um, nonspecific tests that we used to use for lupus. And it turned out, when in, of, of those 3,000 patients that, that uh, Dr. Wallace inherited from Dr. Du Bois, about 1,000 of the patients had lupus, and about 2,000 of them had fibromyalgia. And so as I mentioned before, with fibromyalgia, we can see Raynaud's. We can see that elevated muscle enzyme. The patients ache all over. They can have a positive ANA, and they can have sun sensitivity. So there are many different assays that we can use to differentiate fibromyalgia from lupus. And the one that I commonly use is the Avise CTD assay. It's only, it's not an assay that you can get a Quest or lab for. It typically can only be run in rheumatology offices. 
but <clears throat> it tests for, I think, 16 different autoimmune diseases in addition to the ANA. And so the, 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 their interpretation of this panel is if all the antibody tests are negative, but the ANA is positive, then that patient most likely has fibromyalgia, not an autoimmune disease. Um, some people think that fibromyalgia is an autoimmune disease, but it's actually an autoimmune disease of neurotransmitters. So the patients with fibromyalgia don't have enough of the neurotransmitters in the brain that help control um, pain impulses. And Dr. Daniel Claw, who's been working on fibromyalgia research probably for 40 years now, explains fibromyalgia by saying the patients have their thermostat for hypersensitivity turned up in their brain. So they are hypersensitive to pain, to touch, to sound, to smells, to everything. And so it's, it's um, not something that we would like our patients to have. And the, the problem is that many patients who have an autoimmune disease have secondary fibromyalgia. And Dr. Claw, when he recently spoke at UCLA, said that he felt that about 50% of patients with lupus also had fibromyalgia. And other data shows about 30% of patients with ankylosing spondylitis and rheumatoid arthritis also have fibromyalgia. The problem is we had hoped that when you treat the underlying disease, that the fibromyalgia would get better, the chronic widespread pain would get better, and that usually doesn't happen. So that's why it's extremely important for the rheumatologist, again, if, if you have an autoimmune disease, the, for that person to be examining you and following laboratory studies. So I follow this advice panel. And if the panel all gets normal, but the patient's symptoms aren't any better, then I'm gonna start treating them with fibromyalgia, like something like duloxetine. But again, um, the lab studies show me that the patient's lupus is in remission or other autoimmune disease remission, but they're not feeling any better. And so that's where I'm going to think that they could possibly have fibromyalgia. We talked about ankylosing spondylitis already, and this is uh, the genetic test that I mentioned, this HLA-B27, and as it says here, it can help strengthen uh, a diagnosis. And this is a gene, so its prevalence, I mean, how often it occurs, um, varies by geographic region in the world and, and race, but this uh, gene is certainly uh, more frequently seen in patients with ankylosing spondylitis. But as it says here on the slide, 6.1% of the general U.S. population have the positive B27 gene. <laughs> and it's only felt that about 1.1 or 1.4 million Americans have ankylosing spondylitis. So the gene is, com is found much more than the disease. Um, so it is a heritable condition, a strong genetic correlation. But again, people can have ankylosing spondylitis and have a negative B27 or people can have a positive B27, and maybe they don't have any disease, or they could have ankylosing spondylitis, psoriasis, and other related conditions that we'll talk about in a minute. What makes us realize that it's more than just genetics, if you look at the box on the, the, uh, the, the second to the bottom, AS concordance between twins, that means how often do uh, twins, you know, twins who are identical uh, get only 63, percent of the time for identical twins and 12.5 percent of the time for you know non-identical twins so they've got the same genes and yet they don't end up with the condition so is it some environmental exposure or some other gene that binds the b27 gene we're still um, working on that the problem as it states on the very bottom of the slide is that unfortunately it takes a long time to diagnose patients who have ankylosing spondylitis. And one reason is this is a blood test that isn't ordered very often. In my humble opinion, I feel that ANA is ordered too often and the HLA B27 isn't ordered often enough. So certainly if you have inflammatory back pain where your back pain gets, gets better as the day goes on, you go to bed, it's gone, it comes back the next day, you really wanna ask your healthcare professional to order that HLA B27. Or if you have um, eye inflammation like uveitis, if you have psoriasis, if you have bad nail pitting or scalp psoriasis, uh, 
and you can get that HLA B27 drawn if it's positive. It's helpful in making the diagnosis and getting you in to see the rheumatologist rather than being seen um, by the dermatologist. Unless they're medical dermatologists, and then they might think of using uh, biologic um, therapies. So this slide is really just looking at, um, whoopsie, I didn't mean to do that, is looking at other causes of that B27. So psoriatic arthritis, psoriasis, we used to call Rider syndrome is now reactive arthritis, as I already mentioned, eye inflammation. What I didn't mention is Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Those are all part of this whole seronegative spondyloarthropathy condition uh, where you can have the inflammatory back pain. Some people have psoriasis. Other people will have sores in their mouth. Some will have inflammatory eye disease. So there's this whole group of conditions that can be associated with that B27 gene. And then finally, sacroiliitis, inflammation in the sacroiliac joints that are the joints where the spine um, joins the pelvis. So this is what a rheumatoid factor looks like. And of course, you know, we talked about the rheumatoid factor is positive about 80% of patients who have rheumatoid arthritis, but it can also be seen in patients who have lupus and patients who have Sjogren's syndrome, the one eye with the dry eyes and dry mouth. It can also be seen in patients who have hepatitis C. So, you know, we're seeing more and more now. The recommendation is for all middle-aged people to have be tested for hepatitis C. And if they have that, they can have a positive blood test for rheumatoid arthritis, but not have rheumatoid arthritis. And then there's a condition called cryoglobulinemia, which is not very common, where uh, the fingers can turn very blue when it's cold and your blood can actually <coughs> thicken in the cold and you can get, get blood clots and that is associated with the positive rheumatoid factor as well. But luckily, we don't see that condition very often. So early on, I had mentioned about the CCP or ACFA. This is a blood test that is more sensitive and specific for rheumatoid arthritis. And this slide just shows you that even before the patients start developing symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis, that they can have a positive blood test for rheumatoid arthritis or for the ACFA. So the, this data comes from a, a, a study that was done looking at relatives of patients who had rheumatoid arthritis but didn't have symptoms and how many of them had this positive ACFA or positive rheumatoid factor. And uh, Georg Scheck is his name, and he is now looking at trying to figure out the patients who don't have symptoms but have the positive ACPA how do we know which patients are going to be those ones who turn out to actually develop rheumatoid arthritis? Are they exposed to something in the environment? We know that cigarette smoking, that gum inflammation, living by a freeway, living by a fertilizer factory, lots of different uh, ex inhaled exposures can cause CCPs or ACFAs, but then why do some people get rheumatoid arthritis and others don't? So this is a uh, certainly a, an area of interest to me and to many rheumatologists to try to make some sense of you got the blood test, but why doesn't everybody get uh, the disease? And this slide just looks at of the patients with rheumatoid arthritis, those who are ACPA positive and those who are ACPA negative, those patients who are, um, are positive tend to have changes on their x-ray and changes on the x-ray usually means that the, there's damage to the joints and those patients need to be more actively treated and usually those patients need biologic therapy. This slide is looking at those patients again who have that ACFA or CCP positive, but those patients more likely ha have cardiovascular disease. And now what we're seeing in a lot of patients with rheumatoid arthritis is lung disease. I had a patient that I saw today and she has um, rheumatoid arthritis and she was told she had COPD. Well, she's never smoked. She's never had any inhaled any toxins. So I sent her back to the pulmonary doctor and I said, could she have lung disease related to her rheumatoid arthritis? So again, the rheumatoid arthritis is changing. We used to see a lot of nodules. We don't see that much anymore, but we're seeing more and more pulmonary disease, and especially in those patients who have that ACPA uh, pos positivity. I'm not gonna spend time on this slide because I know I wanna leave some time for questions, but this is just talking about that it's the, 
the immune cells, the B and the T cells that are involved in, in the, the causing of, of autoimmune diseases. And, um, and so that a lot of the work now that's being done is looking at interfering with the way the T and the B cells function to see if we can either prevent these diseases from happening, but certainly prevent them from um, progressing. I mentioned earlier the sedimentation rate, which is a measure of inflammation, and this is really a simple test. You draw the blood in a, a purple or blue top tube. You, you uh, stick a long, a long tube there that has a measurement up to 100, and you see how fast the blood falls um, in an hour. But in older people, their blood falls faster because their blood is heavier. And so the problem with the sedimentation rate is when you look at the lab, they'll say a normal is 20. Well, a normal is 20 for a 20 year old, but 40 is normal for an 80 year old. So often I will get consultations because an 80 year old has an elevated sedimentation rate of 40, well, that's normal. So again, there needs to be education of the um, clinicians as well as patients as to the meaning of these blood tests. So then what we do is we go to a C-reactive protein that can be measured two different ways. So for autoimmune diseases, we use a quantitative C-reactive protein. Cardiologists use the HS C-reactive protein, and that really correlates with um, a heart disease. But the quantitative CRP can be actually followed to look at how your rheumatoid arthritis is doing. So usually every three months, I'll get a quantitative CRP and see if that number is getting better. And if it is, and the tender swollen joint count is getting better, the patient's function is getting better, then I know that, uh, that their arthritis is responding to the medication that I have them, them on. So as you know, we talked about, uh, there's lots of different tests out there that you really need to have an understanding. And please, if you don't understand something that the rheumatologist have, has, has said to you, don't be afraid to ask questions. And I know that patients, uh, you know, who are part of arthritis power, uh, you know, are empowered and they usually aren't afraid to ask questions, but uh, please do because, uh, um, you know, uh, ignorance is not bliss. And if you have knowledge and understand what's going on, I think there's less fear and, and uh, you're taking a more active role um, in, in, in your treatment. And, and the last the bullet just talks about that if your rheumatologist or gastroenterologist or whatever autoimmune disease you have is not routinely monitoring laboratory studies or using patient reported outcomes, so all the patients before they see me uh, fill out a rapid three so it looks at their function and then I am monitoring uh, those CRPs. For patients with rheumatoid arthritis, there's something called a Vectra that monitors their response to therapy. So we want to make certain that not only is the patient feeling better, but their x-rays aren't getting worse, their laboratory studies are getting better. And that way we're making certain that our treatment is, is individualized and the best for that, that certain patient. So that is the end, and I will turn it back and see what questions people have. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Dora. This is uh, great. Really very interesting and informative. Um, so a number of questions have come up um, that we had, and then uh, uh, there's one so far in the chat, or uh, the question window. So if other people have questions, please, uh, now's the time to post them. Uh, so the first question we have is just to, to sort of help better understand. There's a lot of technical information here. So I think just uh, take a step back and understand what, is, what do we mean, or what do you mean when you talk about antibodies, and, and why are they so important in autoimmune diseases? Um, so antibodies typically are what patients form in order to fight off an infection. So when you get a flu vaccine, that is actually stimulating your body to, to, to make antibodies when you get exposed to that virus so you don't get the virus. What happens, though, with autoimmune diseases, it is where your body starts attacking itself by making antibodies against your body. So as I mentioned, the, the double-stranded DNA antibody, that's antibodies against your kidneys in a lupus patient. There's also something called an ANCA, an A-N-C-A, and that's an antibody that we find in patients who have 
vasculitis. So the antibody is attacking the blood vessels. And so if you, again, we don't do these very often, but if you have a tissue biopsy and a certain type of dye is put on that, that, that tissue biopsy, these antibodies can be seen deposited in the kidneys or deposited in the blood vessel walls. So these antibodies are, are what is contributing to the damage caused by the disease or actually causing the disease to begin with. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so a question that came up in the chat window is about something um, that, I, that often shows up on, on blood tests, general blood tests, uh, I believe, in, in primary care. And so the person is asking, can you explain how to read and understand test results for iron levels? And I, I guess more generally, does do iron levels have any relevance uh, for arthritis or, or um, rheumatic disease, autoimmune conditions? Um, can you comment on that? Yeah, a couple things. Um, so if the iron level is low, we always are concerned if a patient is taking an anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen or Aleve, is that medicine causing minimal GI bleeding, so bleeding from the stomach or the bowel that the patient doesn't see, that they don't see blood in the toilet, but they're leaking blood every day from their stomach and that can cause, or their bowel, and that can cause the iron uh, to be low. Conversely, there's something called a ferritin, which is part of the iron, it's iron assay. And, and it is, is like actually the C-reactive protein. The ferritin goes up in patients who have um, inflammation. So some primary care doctors have the ferritin level um, on their routine blood tests. And if the ferritin level is high, then that patient needs to be evaluated to see if they do have some sort of an inflammatory condition that's causing that ferritin to be elevated. If it's low, then again, I would be worried that there is some um, GI bleeding. In this country, we don't often see iron deficiency from lack of iron in the diet, but um, in other places in the world where you know the, the diets are poor, we often see iron deficiency anemia from not getting enough iron in the diet. But now it's usually related uh, in this country to bleeding related to, to anti-inflammatories. The caution here should be that if a patient is fatigued and they start taking iron tablets without the advice of a clinician, the iron can actually deposit in the inflamed areas. And so I've seen patients who are fatigued and decide to take iron supplements on their own and they end up with iron deposit in the liver, iron deposits in the spleen, iron deposits in the joints, and that causes uh, even uh, further problems with the joints. So certainly any of the patients before they start taking over-the-counter iron supplements should definitely check with their clinician to make certain that it, that, that is advisable to do. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Another question that came in, in the chat window is, what is an ANA test? And I think well, you that talked was, about that, this that, earlier. That, right. So the ANA stands for anti-nuclear antibody. So in the olden days, when I was talking about Dr. Du Bois, what we used to do, and if we don't do this anymore, is we would draw blood on a patient and we would carry it around in our, our lab coat um, probably for 15 minutes or so and uh, keep it warm. And then we, with our bare hands, we would take the blood and push it through a screen and then look at it um, like a screen on a house, that type of, that type of screen, not a computer screen because we didn't have them back then, and put it through a screen and you could actually see one cell, one white blood cell that was eating another white blood cell. And that was caused, called a, uh, um, a positive lupid, lupus band test, but the anti-nuclear antibody is where the patient is making antibodies against the nucleus of the cell. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so someone's saying that they, they've been in RA treatment for a couple of years with uh, many different uh, medications tried, but not very successfully. But in all this time, there probably never was any imaging done. 
So uh, the question this patient has is, is there a particular question that they, as a patient, should be asking their, their rheumatologist or physician about that, about imaging? And I know it's, uh, it can be a little bit tricky, I think, to manage up as a patient um, and suggest maybe what a doctor, you know, other tests the doctor could do. But I, I just wonder if you have any insight into that and comment on the value of imaging or how a patient can um, maybe suggest that if, that if that's part of what you're, you're describing as being part of the, the picture besides the history and visually, you know, the visual clinical investigation of the patient and the labs and so on, the imaging is, is you know, an important part of that whole process. Uh, yeah. So what, what advice was, do you have for patients about that? Yeah. There was just an abstract, so a paper that was presented at the European Rheumatology meetings last month that actually looked at imaging to follow a patient's response to therapy and actually said that imaging is very important to begin with to assess the severity of the disease, but it's not very helpful in assessing how well the patient is responding to therapy. So the recommendation was at the beginning when the patient is first seen, if they have rheumatoid arthritis, to get x-rays of their hands or feet, wherever the arthritis is the worst. And if the x-rays are normal, uh, but the patient has a positive rheumatoid factor, uh, maybe a positive CCP, an exam consistent with rheumatoid arthritis, if the x-rays are normal, then just at baseline to get an ultrasound of the joints or an MRI, and usually the insurance is an ultrasound or an MRI, to see if there is already joint damage. And typically, if, there's, if the patient already has joint damage when they first see us, I'll normally talk to them and say, you have rheumatoid arthritis, unless there's contraindication, I'm gonna put you on methotrexate for a couple months and see how you do, but you already have joint damage. Methotrexate doesn't prevent joint damage very well, so you're gonna to need to go on biologic therapy after those first couple months of methotrexate. But the recent data suggests that monitoring the response by x-ray or ultrasound or MRI doesn't provide any more information. However, uh, again, as I mentioned before, things like C-reactive protein and that Vectra are, are very important. I have a, a patient who has both rheumatoid and osteoarthritis. And she has failed every single medicine that's been available over the last 30 years, except for one. So I thought, oh, this must just be her osteoarthritis and not her rheumatoid arthritis that is causing all of this disability. And I will tell you, out of 400 rheumatoid patients, luckily, I only have this one that hasn't responded to therapy. But so I got this Vectra, the blood test that's a, a, what's called a biomarker that if this test is less than 30, then it suggests that the patient's symptoms are not related to rheumatoid arthritis. If the number is greater than 70, then it means this patient's rheumatoid arthritis isn't under very good control at all. And if the number is between 30 and 70, it's sort of, well, they're probably not gonna get disabled by rheumatoid arthritis. But I ordered it on this patient and her number was 54, which meant that her rheumatoid arthritis was causing some of her symptoms and that none of my treatment over the last 25 years has controlled her disease. So we're on the last currently medicine that's available and hopefully we'll have another couple more this year and can try those on her. But it's important to look at tender and swollen joint count, C-reactive protein, and the vector in rheumatoid arthritis to monitor that response to therapy. And as I mentioned earlier, if her vector would have been 15, then I would say, oh, it's her osteoarthritis fibromyalgia that's causing the pain and uh, um, you know, treat her with some NSAIDs and some duloxetine instead of trying to find another biologic therapy for her. I see, okay, yeah, thanks. But it sounds like in general though, imaging, at least based on the, the recent um, result findings from the study that was presented at UR, that imaging is helpful initially uh, at, at baseline to. Uh, see if there's already been uh, joint damage or bone erosion or damage um, because that speeds up the process of making sure someone 
is starts on a biologic to prevent further erosion, it sounds like. But for monitoring the effectiveness of treatment, it's not actually that helpful. That's the most <clears throat> up-to-date information as of a month ago, yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, another question about, you talked a bit about fibromyalgia and, and RA. So this question is maybe something of a recap, but can fibromyalgia coexist with rheumatoid arthritis? And then can the discernment uh, determine, or can you, through a, um, using blood tests, can you determine whether the disease is caused by one or the other? So you just alluded to Vectra, for example, and, and that helps determine that the pain is being caused by RA and not osteoarthritis or or, or something else, but um, I guess for fibro and, and RA, how do you how do how do blood tests help inform what's going on? Exactly, exactly what you just said. So if a person has lupus and fibro, then I'm using something like the Avise, which is again a panel, a blood panel for many different autoimmune diseases, but it also looks specifically at several different antibody tests in lupus, and if the the ANA, the anti nuclear antibody, is positive but the rest of that panel is negative, then most likely the patient's symptoms are related to fibromyalgia. So in rheumatoid arthritis, as we talked about, often these patients' sedimentation rate and C-reactive protein can be normal, and yet they have active rheumatoid arthritis. And so that's where the Vectra is helpful. But as my patient, um, if she were younger and didn't have osteoarthritis, but had, had fibro, I've had this in another patient, actually, who I haven't seen for a while. Um, she had mild rheumatoid arthritis, but terrible fibro, and she kept wanting me to change her rheumatoid arthritis medicine. And so the vector was very helpful for me to show her that her vector was 11, and that meant her, that her pain was not related to her rheumatoid arthritis, which was under good control based on my exam and based on the vector, and that we needed to do a better job of treating her fibromyalgia. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, now, there's so many questions in here that um, I hope we'll get through all of them. Uh, so someone asked, um, just trying to get back to it here, a few questions about AS um, and the, um, <coughs> let's see, sorry, to get lost here. Um, okay, so someone asked if they they were just diagnosed, they say, positive with rheumatoid arthritis about two months ago, but they also tested positive with um, with the um, HLA-B27. HLA uh-huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. But they don't have any back symptoms at all. So they wonder, they're wondering if it's possible to have that gene mutation but not actually have AS. And also, um, could methotrexate help alleviate or prevent any, any, uh, any back-related uh, inflammation or pain. So, yeah, so does HLA B27 indicate other things besides AS, and what, how does methotrexate play into all this in terms of treatment? So, as, 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 as we talked about, um, normal people can have a positive HLA B27, but also juvenile patients who have juvenile arthritis can also have a positive HLA B27 and a rheumatoid factor. And one thing that we're seeing now, you know, there are a lot of people with type 1 diabetes now, which is the autoimmune type of diabetes, that we used to said type 1 was never found in adults. And now we're finding evidence of type 1 diabetes in 20 and 30-year-olds. And, and what we're also seeing now is that there are some 20 and 30-year-olds who actually are presenting as if they have juvenile uh, arthritis. And these patients have a positive ANA, they can have a positive rheumatoid factor, they can have a positive HLA B27, and then we'll frequently go back in their history and say, did you have growing pains when you were a teenager? Uh, did you maybe have what the doctor thought was a viral arthritis, and now, you know, this is presenting as, an, as a young adult with, uh, with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, if the patient doesn't have a positive B27 and doesn't have any back pain, the B27, as I talked about, can just be there and not cause any symptoms, but it also can be associated with psoriasis, inflammatory eye disease, uh, in, uh, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. So there are other 
autoimmune diseases that can be associated with that D27. Methotrexate, again, at data presented at the European Rheumatology meetings showed that methotrexate was not effective in preventing progression of ankylosing spondylitis and only biologic therapy in some specific patients has been shown to prevent the progression of ankylosing spondylitis. Okay. And is CRP, the C-reactive protein, ever elevated in AS and ankylosing spondylitis? Oh, yes. So those are the patients. Those patients who have an elevated ankle, have an elevated C-reactive protein, one, they're more likely to progress, but two, they're more likely to respond to biologic therapy to prevent them pr from progressing. So at the European meetings, what they were talking about was if you have ankylosing spondylitis, you have an elevated C-reactive protein, and when they do the MRI of your vertebral bodies and they see what's called bone marrow edema, which is inflammation along the corners of the vertebral bodies. That shows that you're at increased risk of progression of the disease and that you should respond to biologic therapy. Okay. And is there, as once someone's been um, diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, is there a need to retest the rheumatoid factor and ACPA once that diagnosis has been made? Most data suggests that following rheumatoid factors is useless, um, that it's very useful for diagnosis, but not useful for following response to therapy. In some patients, the ACPA, the CCP, will actually improve as their condition improves. Uh, but at, again, at the European meetings, they were um, suggesting that that doesn't happen in all the patients, and, and certainly I have patients who are in remission whose um, ACPA, the CCP, is, is greater than 250. It's so high it can't be measured. So again, at the European meetings, they were saying rather than following the rheumatoid factor and the CCP, it's better to use a panel such as the Vectra uh, that, that, that has been shown in the majority of people to be able to determine um, their response to the medicine. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. We're at the time on this. You do have a number of questions, and we'll do our best to follow up with you, Dr. Dorr, um, to, to get some of these answered and maybe posted along with the recording of this webinar for anyone who missed uh, the live uh, presentation today. This has been extremely informative and, and great to have you on board. And I guess my big take home from this is that um, in, knowing your labs and knowing what they mean and how they can be used is, is very important, but it's, it's no substitute for other uh, aspects of uh, the diagnosis and the monitoring of the disease, like the, the history and the, having uh, a doctor actually see you in person and be able to, um, to you know, see and, and touch you and find the tender joints and also um, and, and imaging in, in certain cases as well. So I really appreciate the, your expertise and, and the time that you took with us. Um, any final uh, closing remarks or thoughts before we sign off here? Well, I would just like to thank everyone for uh, who spent the, the time today and, and hopefully that they were able to, you know, to take home some, uh, some important information. But again, also through arthritis power to really, you know, empower the patients and, you know, that there's, there's so much that, that the patient can do to help themselves. And it's very difficult. I talk to the patients about this all the time, that, that you've got a disease, you're trying to work, you're trying to you know, work with your friends and family and being your own advocate sometimes is, is, it's overwhelming. So to use, you know, this organization to really empower you and, and sort of teach you how, you know, where you should be spending your energy. And so, you know, learn the questions to ask to the, the doctor. And then I think the only other thing that's really important is do you have to trust the rheumatologist or other specialist who's taking care of you. And if you're constantly questioning them, are you sure this is the right thing? Are you, why didn't you order this test? And you ask that all the time to, to, in order to help you to get better, to feel more comfortable with your disease. I think you need to change doctors and find somebody that you have confidence in, that you can develop a plan together and know that the two of you together are going to get you as good as you can be.
Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Dorr. Um, we really appreciate it and look forward to seeing you again soon. So have a great uh, evening, everyone, and thanks again for attending and, and for um, Dr. Dorr for sharing your, your knowledge with us. Thank you very much for asking me to uh, to, to be available. It was uh, um, very enjoyable. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks.